What is up, you guys? Welcome back to another edition of the podcast. My name is Ramon, and this is Dad's Podcast Project. And today, I wanted to talk to you guys about grilling. It is one of the more favorite pastimes of my life growing up as a kid, and it is something that I continue to do on a extremely regular basis, if not every week, multiple times a week. We stay grilling in this house. So the reason I want to talk about this now is because there's a new addition to my grilling family, um, not like children-wise, but grill-wise. I ended up purchasing a Traeger uh, pellet grill. It is the Ironwood 650. And there was a lot going into the thought process of why I wanted to pick this up. So if you're into grilling, then you might be keen on this episode. If you're not, well, it's going to be about grilling. Um, spoiler warning, we're going to be talking about barbecuing. So there was a lot that went into even, even deciding on making this purchase to begin with. Growing up as a kid, I remember just barbecuing and being in the backyard with my dad. And that was, that was a staple of our, of our weekends. That's what we did. And my dad was, he was all about barbecuing on the Oak barbecue pit. And so you'd have to get the logs ready. We had a pretty, a pretty good size wood pile in the backyard. Whenever we were running low, we would go out and pick up more wood. And usually it would be about uh, a truck bed full of wood. Uh, my brother and I, we have <laughs> a couple memories where we were taking that wood from the truck to the backyard and stacking it up on the wood pile. And it being it being about a job and a half just to do that as kids. Um, but it wasn't like it was just strictly barbecuing with this wood. I mean, we would have fires in the house. We would have bonfires. It was just, we just had a lot of wood. And so one of the things that Um, we would do a lot is barbecuing on the oak pit or barbecuing on the wood pit with red oak. Now, being that this was something that, uh, my, my dad had just, it was a part of what he, he enjoys doing. Surely as kids we're, we're hanging around and we're watching him and it's like, what's this? And we slowly got brought into the fold and learned the trade or the skill of how to barbecue on an oak pit or on a wood fire pit. Uh, that was a lot of interesting stories growing up, at least for myself. I remember my dad telling me that you, you got to watch the flame. You can't just walk away from the barbecue pit. You got Someone's got to be there watching it. And it was more like a safety thing. If you're barbecuing in your backyard, you definitely don't want your house to burn down. So you don't want to walk away from it. So as a kid, sometimes I would get caught up. I would be bored with whatever I was watching on TV or whatever video game I was playing. And I would make my way outside and say, hey, what are you, what are you up to, Dad? And he would tell me, oh, you know, I'm getting the barbecue started. Why don't you go ahead and watch, watch the fire for me and I'll be right out. And little did I know that this was actually like a trap because watching the fire until he would be right back, um, he wasn't the fastest. He would be in the house and I would imagine, yeah, he's prepping the meat and whatnot. But sometimes I'm sitting out there and I'm waiting and it's like, what are you doing? Like, (laughs) are you in there sitting watching TV and kicking it until this, until the fire's ready? So that was sort of my introduction. And then as time went on, um, I asked to try things like, can I try barbecuing one day? Can I do this? Can I do that? And my dad would sit back and just observe and give me little pointers here or there on what I was doing or how to, how to go about, uh, on the grill and until I felt comfortable. And then it was something that I just adopted and started doing. When I first moved out, um, My dad, he got me either he, no, he handed it down actually. He had a Weber kettle grill, um, so a charcoal grill, and he was getting a newer one, I believe, and he ended up giving me one of his older ones. And so that was my very own first grill, uh, was a Weber charcoal grill. 
And so my dad had two barbecue pits. He had the uh, the oak pit and then a charcoal pit, uh, a Weber. And those were what we grilled on. The Weber was considered like something quick, even though lighting up coals and getting that started, that's not even a quick task for any of those, any of you out there who, who barbecue on the regular or on charcoal. Uh, that still is a process. It's not as much of a process as getting a, a, a wood fire going, but it is a process nonetheless. You still have to dedicate some time before you can eat. And I always felt like when it came to barbecuing on charcoal, like sometimes the food would be ready and I felt like I had a little bit more life left in those coals and I always wanted to just grab something else and throw it on there because I didn't want to waste charcoal. It's not like it's really expensive, but I always felt like it. I still have heat. I still have something that I can do with this and I felt like I should. I should be... Like I need to throw something else on here. Um, typically, it would just be a tri-tip or we do burgers. Uh, never really like some of the staples you see on television and movies. We never threw hot dogs on the grill. It was always like a burger. Uh, that was something quick and easy. But for the most part, it was like tri-tip or baby back ribs. Um, one time we would do, or not one time, but a couple of times we had done beef ribs, which those kick off some real smoke. Like you get a lot of smoke coming off that that kettle uh, when doing beef ribs. On the oak pit, we would do pretty much the same thing. But the one thing that was different with that versus charcoal was we would do chicken halves. And for those of you who are from the Central Coast, you're familiar with Santa Maria style barbecue. Uh, chicken halves that are then later cut into quarters is pretty much a staple of any barbecue uh, in different states, depending on where you are at, uh, sometimes you'll have different cuts of meat thrown on the grill. But if you're from here, uh, it's usually chicken or tri-tip. Tri-tip was another staple that we would have on the barbecue. And so this was what I grew up around, and this is what I grew up eating. There was one very memorable summer that we barbecued every weekend of that summer. And... It's like we had barbecue every day that one summer. It was like intense. And I feel like that's the time I learned the most. Like I learned how to barbecue chicken halves, tri-tip. Uh, linguisa is pretty simple. It's already cooked through. So you're really just heating it up. Um, we would throw pasillas on the grills for like grilled peppers. Uh, that mean, It was just almost anything and everything we were throwing up there. But that was like sort of the the circle of meats, I guess you can say, that, that we cooked within. Areas that we didn't really delve too much into was what, say, smokers would introduce. So if you had like an offset smoker, now you're starting to look into different cuts of meat. Like... Gosh, what is it called? I'm drawing a blank right now. Uh, like a pork butt. Um, gosh, it's really going to bother me now. A can't even think of it. I'm going to have to Google it. But <laughs> there's um like smoked smoked ribs. Um, there is. I'm Googling it right now. It's really going to bother me, but there is, um, I think you can smoke chicken as well, but let me see here. It's like really bad. Internet's super slow right now too. Slow cooked BBQ. Let's see what comes up. And of course, the typical ribs, pulled pork, brisket, that's it. And brisket, brisket was something that we never barbecued. I've never personally done a brisket in my life. It is something that now with this Traeger, I am entertaining the thought of purchasing a brisket and 
taken a stab at it. I, I've done a lot of different cuts of meat. I've done uh, venison, um, elk steaks. Uh, a couple of buddies of mine uh, are avid hunters, and they just had some elk meat on hand, and we just fired up the grill, threw it on there, and they were a little nervous about it, but as soon as it came off and we were eating it, it was like, okay, this is not bad. Uh, <laughs> I've never done it before, but it was it was sure was good. Um, and yeah, just <laughs> had a little brain fart, but when you when you have these like different types of grills, it opens up different types of queuing that you might not have done before it for myself so to speak it is i've never done brisket i've never done um like a slow cooked pork i've never smoked any meats and having a trigger is something that i feel is opening that opportunity for me to to try uh i've i've attempted um slow cooking ribs baby back ribs on a weber I'm always like weary of having unlit coals slowly start burning. Uh, I just feel like it offers a different kind of taste to the meat when, when doing that. It might just be me. It might not be a real thing, but at least for myself, I feel like I'm tasting a difference in the meat whenever cooking with uncooked coals and usually doing that snake method uh, laying out the coals around the perimeter of the of the pot um, where one side is lit and it slowly burns its way around. I feel like it offers a different kind of taste to the meat, even though you're throwing wood chips or wood chunks on top for a little bit of that smoky flavor. Um, but I guess getting into the point of uh, purchasing the grill, it was... There was a lot of thought that went into it. I, whenever it comes to like a big purchase, I, I tend to really take my time and look into it a lot. And one of the reasons I settled on the Ironwood 650 is that it just sort of checked all the boxes off uh, that I needed in a grill. Um, I'd never barbecued on a pellet grill before. I had my skepticism when initially going into it. I felt that, again, uh, Harking back to growing up, uh, barbecuing with my dad, he was all about barbecuing on, on the wood pit and his sort of acceptance area of quick and easy fashion of barbecuing or method of barbecuing would be a Weber. And so when I asked him one time about what, what his thoughts were on gas grilling and again, everybody has their preferences depending on where you are. Um, I think that there are certain states that they're all about gas grilling. Other states are all about grilling with coal. And I know that here on the Central Coast, it seems like everybody has uh, a wood barbecue in their backyard. But he he just thought if you're going to grill on gas, you might as well just throw the meat on the stove. That it it's... It's not that it's not barbecuing, but it's there was something less than satisfactory about it when comparing it to, say, grilling meat on a Weber or over coals or grilling meat ultimately over wood. And so I was curious about what it was going to be like knowing that you have to, well, for one, plug a trigger in to use electricity. I mean, this is now we're starting to, to meld technology with sort of age old ancient technology, which is just fire and an igniter. And that was pretty much it. And just a box to hold that in. Now we're introducing computer system that is monitoring the temperature and maintaining the temperature, an auger that is feeding wood pellets into a crucible, which then ignites those pellets and cre creates that heat source and that source of, uh, well, a byproduct of burning the wood pellets is smoke. So introducing the smoke into the cook as well. 
And with that, there's also a fan to blow air through that auger's tube or the tube with which the auger sits in and sort of add oxygen to the whole, the whole process. And it's really like a, I don't know, it's a, it, maybe it's an updated version of, of a, of a time honored tradition of barbecuing, but there was a lot of technology that's, that's being introduced here and a lot of room or areas for failure. So some of these areas that I definitely did not want to have to experience is one, a grease fire. Um, I'm not sure if grease fires are really a thing on an oak pit. I've never seen one myself. Maybe someone's done it out there, but with regular maintenance and, and sort of care of your grill and clean outs of ash, I think you can prevent uh, any form of grease fire from, from occurring in an oak pit. Um, and again, I've never experienced a grease fire in a Weber kettle before. However, when my wife and I moved into our, our home, I wanted sort of a, an everyday driver kind of barbecue and being a fanboy of Weber products, I thought, well, a gas grill or propane for that matter probably fits the bill. And so we went out and we purchased a gas grill and there again, grease fires. It's <laughs> all the drippings and all the grease sort of just sits in there. And one little fireball ignites that. And there you go. You've got a grease fire. And now I guess I was really introduced into to barbecuing over propane with um, or natural gas. I, actually, when my wife and I were living in uh, an apartment down in Southern California, they had sort of a communal <laughs> barbecue pit. And I don't recommend people use the community barbecue because no one takes care of it. The thing was just nasty. It was so nasty. Um, I was throwing on some chicken on the barbecue and I got a grease fire and just all this black, thick smoke and soot was flying into the air because I had to let it burn out. I turned off the, the gas source. I turned off the flames and this grease fire was just roaring and I just had to let it go because there was nothing, there's nothing you can do. You can't add water to it. You, there's no, what am I going to grab a fire extinguisher when I'm right here monitoring things? So I just let it burn out. But having our own gas grill here at the house, it was like, okay, well, what's the, what's the preventative maintenance that I can do then on a gas grill? And it, it came down to pretty much every time I would buy a new propane bottle, I would do a full sort of clean out of the entire grill. I mean, my, my sort of go-to meats on the propane was burgers, chicken breast, just meal prepping for the week, throwing on vegetables, uh, fish fillets, just simple stuff. If any time I needed to grill for, say, over 30 minutes, then I would wheel out my, my charcoal grill and I would use that because propane is like the tank only has so much and charcoal. It's like, I don't know. My thought process is that I don't want to burn up propane on a long cook. I would rather use coals for that because at least I know I'm using X amount of coals and it's going to get me an hour cook propane for that matter. I don't want to run out in the middle of a, of a cook and then just be out without a paddle because even with like a weight system and all this other stuff, there's no telling exactly how much propane you have in that tank. It's just, it's, it's the nature of it. So grease fires was one of the things that I want to check off and it seems at least, and depending on where you go, what videos you're looking at, it seems as if a trigger, you're not cooking over the direct flame. And so long as you have the food that you're cooking over the, the drip pan, it seems as if the, it's almost impossible to get a grease fire. I'm not going to say impossible 
because again, there are videos out there. If you're looking on YouTube or you're looking wherever, there are videos where people are having grease fires in their in their cookers. So almost impossible. The other box I needed checked off was the heat source, the the pellets. How long do they last in comparison to a tank of propane? And what is the initial cost? Because a tank of propane, when going in and doing the exchange and the refill and all that stuff, 20 bucks, I think. A bag of pellets, 18 on sale, 19 regular. So a little bit of savings, but how, what's the, what's the, what's the time of like, what's the life of, of a bag versus the life of a, of a canister of propane. So there was actually a guy, (laughs) I wish I had the YouTube link to put in the show notes, but there's actually a guy who took an entire bag of trigger pellets and let his smoker go until they all ran out. And I think he got over 24 hours with an entire bag of pellets. So what that tells me is that if during the week I'm averaging cooks that are about 30 minutes, 20 minutes or so, I'm looking pretty good. If I'm doing cooks that are an hour, of course, probably an hour and a half, maybe even two hours with, because that's something that I also had to think about with the Traeger was the initial heating and then the shutdown process of the grill. It's not like a propane grill. As soon as you turn those knobs, you're you're cut off. Flames are off. Uh, Turn off the propane and and you're done. You can walk away, let the grill cool down. Not the case with the Traeger. However, if you've grilled on a wood pit, it is very similar to where there's a shutdown process. The flame has to die down. If there are still wood pellets in there, that's that's got to be extinguished. So there's a there's a process to shutting it down. They usually have a timer set up. At least my my trigger has a timer set up, so it tells me just about how long the shutdown process is. But if you have a wood pit, I mean, sometimes you got to time that last log just right. Otherwise, you're still gonna have a good fire for a little bit and. I mean, that's why I feel like a wood pit's not really a daily driver, just in my opinion. I feel like a wood pit, that's more of a weekend thing. That's having people over. That's entertaining because after it's done, you can sit and eat outside next to the pit while the fire's still dying down. You can, you know, crack a cold one, have soda, some juice, whatever it is that you're drinking and sit with your buddies or your friends or your family and just sit by the pit while it's still winding down. So that's why I feel like an oak pit is something that's like a weekend thing. But the Traeger really fits for me, and it's quickly becoming apparent that it's it's quite possibly just going to be my daily driver. And the reason I say that is that when I got it, um, also <laughs> a little note, I don't have a pickup or a truck. So when I bought mine, I had to get it in the box. And fortunately for me, the folks at Miners still had one in a box. I always get that look too. Like when, cause when I bought my gas grill, I asked them, I was like, I see, I know you guys have plenty on the floor and I know you have the exact one that I want on the floor, but do you have one that's not assembled in a box? Because again, we're throwing it in the back of the CRV. I, I don't have the room for a fully built one. So I, this this grill, as well as my gas grill, uh, I assembled myself, and it was super easy, like really, really easy to put this grill together. They say it requires two people. Um, I had to do it by myself, so there was a little bit of thinking outside the box when it came to standing it up. Uh, the other things was the first initial burn. Um, there's a lot of smoke <laughs> that comes off that thing in its initial burn, uh, they, I think they ship it with like a light oil over a lot of the components and inside of the, inside of the cooking area. So that to prevent rust and things like that. So all that had to burn off. 
So there was a ton of smoke. Fortunately, my neighbors were out of town and they didn't have to like see this huge plume of smoke coming from the other side of the fence. But uh, that was that was another thing that we had to do as a part of the setup. Much different than a Weber. I don't think there was a break in or anything like that when it comes to those grills. I think as soon as it's assembled, you're ready to just start cooking. I mean, you do need to season the grill, but that just comes with with barbecuing, uh, having meat on there, whether you're starting out with bacon or really fatty meat, um, that just comes with it. The other difference with the Traeger, um, that I notice is that while not cooking over a direct flame, there's a chance for all those little like bits and gristle to, <laughs> to stick to the grill. And for anybody who cooks on a Weber, or on an oak pit, you know that that flame is your friend. It's burning off all that stuff. And you just take a wire brush and you just clean it all and you're good to go. Not the case on a Traeger. Uh, one of the things I look into and I'll probably be ordering soon is a, a wood scraper. Because I think this grill is a little bit more delicate in that sense. That you don't want to use a wire brush. I'm not exactly sure why. I think it has to do something with the coating or the way that the grill is coated. Um, that a wire brush might damage that. So a wood scraper is in my future. <laughs> right now I actually used a um, kind of like a scotch Bright to uh, gently wipe off the, the little bits after my first cue, which was, in fact, um, a rack of baby back ribs, two racks, actually. So I went with the method that, is posted on Traeger's website because I don't know. I, I've been barbecuing like what I feel is my whole life. And yet here I have this new grill and I, I'm like, how do I, how do I use this? I know it's just heat and time, but, and there's a lot more control over the amount of heat that I'm putting in. But as I stated earlier in the podcast, smoking is not really something that I've ever done. So to me, it's like, what temperature does the should the grill be at? How long should I smoke this for? And then when I round it off, what should the temperature be? So if you go on like Traeger's app, they recommend a, I think it's 180 or 125 or something like that. Because around that heat range, you can use their, what is called super smoke on the ironwood series. I'm not sure if it's on the pro line, but on the ironwood series, there's a super smoke button. And if you're at that lower temperature, I think it just allows you to get a little bit of that, a little bit more of the smoke flavor into the meat, but they wanted like three hours of smoking, which to me, it's like, okay, how much, how much are we trying to render this fat? Because I understand that when it comes to cooking low and slow, you're rendering the fat down, you're pulling the meat away from the bone and you're creating a lot, like it's breaking it down in a different kind of way than if you were to just jam those ribs in there and blast it for an hour at 425 degrees and then pull it out. You're going to get a completely different rib if you smoke it for three hours, pull it off, wrap it, put it back in there, meat side down and finish it off. And so three hours. I'm looking at it like, okay, let's give it a shot. We'll cook it low and slow for three. And then I would imagine we wrap it and throw it meat side down and cook it until we get the internal temps that we're looking for. But as hunger starts to set in, I think to myself, I'm not going to be able to wait three hours. So about an hour and a half in, or maybe it was two hours in, I end up cranking it from 185 to like 225 and letting it go for another 30 minutes. Then I pull them and already like the colors already looking the way I want it to look or the the way that I'm used to anyways. I pull the ribs, I wrap them, I throw them back in upside down or meat side down wrapped in foil. And I'm like, let's finish them off. I crank that sucker up to 400 degrees and just monitor it for internal temps at that time. I figure let's just blast it. I mean, what... (laughs) How many, how many pellets do I need to go through? Uh, 
or how long does it really need to take? So I think that about halfway into my cook, I started feeling like I know what I'm doing here. Like it, it, it's one thing to see these recipes and to take them as like sort of using them as guidelines. Uh, but for anybody out there who's barbecued for any period of time, I think that after a while, uh, the term like cooking with soul is like a real thing. Like you end up just, you can feel it and you can, you, you know what you're doing. So sure enough, I pulled them off and let them rest. And I'll tell you what, I was using Traeger's signature gourmet blend. I'm not a huge fan of hickory. It's a little strong for me. Like it, it makes the meat taste a little too sweet and I'm, I'm not used to that. I'm more of an oak or even cherry flavor but this signature blend had like hickory maple and cherry it these ribs were just out of this world amazing i took a picture threw it up on the gram meat peeling off the bone like these bones were clean no meat sticking and i didn't put any barbecue sauce for those of you out there who are fans of the sauce that's that's great it's kind of difficult. Uh, my buddy Steve and I, we always talk about it. Like, are you sauce? Are you dry rub? Like, what is it? For me, I'm sauce on beef ribs, but I'm dry on pork. Uh, it's just the way that that I prefer it. Um, I've had sauced up baby backs and they're fine. But when it comes to me doing it myself, I prefer just a garlic, salt, and pepper. Uh, I'm, I don't even get crazy with the dry rub, to be honest. It's, I keep it super simple and just the flavor of that smoke, saltiness of that garlic salt, it was just perfect. I was, I was definitely in heaven with that. Um, for that last hour also, I threw on a, uh, couple linguices and, uh, a sausage for my son. Also four baked potatoes. I didn't wrap them in foil though. I was looking on again on Traeger's app. And they say, well, you can just throw the potatoes right on and it'll be fine. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> they were not. Uh, they look super dry. I mean, the inside was kind of chalky. It was just, they didn't come out great. Uh, my wife, I, I'll leave the baked potatoes to her because she, she does them up and they come out real good. She puts butter and some salt and wraps them in foil. And I mean, I've never been disappointed in a baked potato uh, when she's making it. So I think for the future, I'll just I'll just let her prep the potatoes. But it was an awesome, awesome meal. Today I actually threw on another piece of meat. Uh, we picked up a tri tip, and this is my this will be my meat for uh, the work week. So I think we're doing good. I've got about sixty. Well, the this Traeger model comes with a pellet sensor, and it's telling me I have about sixty percent. Of the pellets left so i had the trigger going for maybe three and a half four hours on my first cook and then today i had it on there for maybe 45 50 minutes for my second cook and we're talking four to five hours of cooking already and i've used up 40 percent so if it's 10 percent per and again, I, I'll have to do more testing, but I'm liking it so far. I, th I think that I think that this is definitely going to work out. <laughs> I'll have to think about, because now I'm starting to look at like, okay, what's the maintenance on this thing? Um, as a machinist, I, I work on Haas machines. I, I service them as best that I can, but we have augers and we have a lot of electrical components that are very similar to what's going on in these triggers. So I think that if it ever comes to having to open it up and do some internal work, uh, I'll feel pretty comfortable. However, it's really just the, the maintenance. Like I said earlier, when it came to my Weber uh, gas grill, cleaning that out once every propane tank uh, seemed to work out. Now that we're into the wood pellet territory, and we have ash flowing about because though it's not as bad as say the Weber smoke fire pellet grill with ash, just like covering your meat. Um, there is still ash 
that is blowing around. So is it once every couple of barbecues? Take all the stuff out and vacuum out the ash. Or is it once every time the hopper's empty? I have a 20 pound hopper. How many barbecues is that? I would think that burning all that, all those wood pellets would generate a lot of ash. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking like maybe once every other barbecue, I'll take it apart and um, vacuum out the ash. I'm actually going to be throwing on some barbecue, um, not barbecue, some burger patties. I'm throwing on some burger patties tomorrow. And so I'll pull all the sheet metal and take a look in there and see how much ash I've generated after four hours and make a, an, a, uh, an assessment after that. I'm also going to see how this grilling does with a burger. If it doesn't do too well, I still have my propane uh, grill, but I would really love to be able to do burgers and not even have to think or worry about uh, flare ups because that, that's just not fun. I, I get it like seeing the flame and all this, but after a while it's like, I just want to cook a burger and I don't want to have to think about flare ups or all these, you know, grease fires and all this other crazy stuff. I would just like to throw the meat on there and just have it cook. Let's not get crazy. So yeah, that's been my experience. Um, I'm sure I'll be talking about grills a little bit more. I was kind of all over the place with this one, but it's just been really fun. My brother also picked up a Traeger and we've been like shooting each other text messages, just back and forth talking about our experiences. And I think these Traegers are definitely going to be putting in a lot of, a lot of work over the next couple of days, next couple of weeks. As I am now done with finals, I'm on a pretty good break and there's a lot of barbecuing I want to do. I'm already thinking about Thanksgiving and possibly smoking a turkey on the grill. I'm sort of theory crafting and looking up recipes online, watching a couple videos on YouTube. Um, I've only had a barbecue turkey once. I've had a deep fried turkey, which still remains like the tippy top in terms of like how good a turkey can, can be on Thanksgiving. Uh, if you have the space and the oil, uh, deep fry a turkey, give it a shot. It's really good, but I'm going to cut it there. You guys, I want to thank you guys for taking the time to listen. And as always till next time, see ya.